Hello everyone, today we talk about the Italic Kingdom during the reigns of Lothar III and Conrad III. We never talked really about uh, the single rulers uh, in detail, right? Uh, not even for the German Kingdom as such, we talked about yes, the first half of the 12th century in Germany, especially uh, the fallout right, of the uh, investiture controversy, and we did talk extensively about uh, the Swabian dynasty uh, and just as, as a broader period we did encompass the, the Salian period that came to an end in 1125 so more or less we're no strangers uh, on Schwerpunkt to the events of Lothar of Samplenburg and Conrad III the, the uh, uh, from the Swabian Staufen reigns in, on a general level. Today we mostly observe the relation between the sovereigns, the Italic Kingdom, and even more specifically the Mathildine inheritance, as well as the political and ecclesiastical order at a feudal and communal level in northeastern Italy. Right At some other point we will talk uh, more in depth about other regions, Today we will, of course, address what was happening in Milan, what was happening in Rome, uh, unavoidably. Uh, in this quite tormented phase, actually, of Holy Roman Imperial history, because here you have Lothar Sapplenberg effectively managing even to be crowned as Holy Roman Emperor in Rome, which Conrad III will not be able to, even though he was, as we will see now, planning his Italian campaign after the Second Crusade. right? And this was quite a, you know, shattered moment, definitely. The rise to the throne of Lothar of Samplenburg was, uh, in many ways, uh, given his uh, Saxon ducal title, a reaction to the Franconian hegemony of the previous uh, monarchs. And then, as you know, had, had to combat um, not just the German nobility in the, the fort of power concentration in the Eastern Fr Frankish Kingdom, but especially the papacy that could make uh, uh, an enormous leverage uh, in Germany. But we tend, at least not to realize how deeply intertwined, especially at this point in the higher Middle Ages, the Kingdom of Italy and the Eastern Frankish uh, one really were, right? Especially as, in as much as the participation of northern Italian vassals to German affairs during the Diets as a general balance for the uh, the Roman rule um, in, in, in the Empire. Um, when you look at the rise of Lothar Samplenburg, you realize definitely that uh, he emerged as a uh, Benjamin, let's say, of the German Episcopate and Pope Honorius II. There is all a background to this, but to make the long story short, the uh, conquered that of Worms, and so de facto the victory of the papacy in the investiture controversy, especially as far as the Italian affairs were concerned, had deeply shattered the public authority in Germany. Right, there had been a, a vassalization of, for example, episcopal investitures. Uh, there had been a general sense that that great effort that the Ottonians and the Salians had made to to create a, a national monarchy, right, similarly to what was happening in France and England, uh, had been severely compromised. Much of the angst that um, the, the Swabians, especially Frederick Barbarossa, would would um, uh, would uh, express, right, uh, an obstinate in in the um, in the Lombard campaigns and the attempt, in fact, of reasserting probably a direct control over the Italic Kingdom is a reaction to this uh, in many ways. We will see it now because also Conrad's interest in Italy is, is often overlooked as far as the connection eventually with his, with his nephew, Frederick, uh, is concerned. Right? Um, naturally, <laughs> a, a German election could not be uh, you know, a good one without uh, an anti-king rising against Lothar of Samplenburg that was, in fact... Um, Conrad, right, the Swabian uh, Stauffen, 
that uh, evidently expressed for many reasons that continuity with the Salians and that was involved in Italy, right? Uh, where he sought support there against Lothar, right? And even managing in having himself crowned with all solemnity by the Archbishop Anselm of Milan, that at the time, by the way, was essentially in, in a quarrel with Honorius II for uh, reasons of ecclesiastical policy. Now, the main reason why... Uh, the Swabian uh, party would arise at this point was the 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 imperial legacy that in many ways the Stau the, the Staufen at this point were collecting from the Franconians, right? That, uh, as you know, the Senate is essentially from um, from Henry the uh, daughter. They had been loyal to uh, Henry the Fifth. Uh, and uh, as such, they claim the latter's um, allodial patrimonia, especially as they had been now elected as anti kings to uh, Lothar of, of Samplenburg. The Swabians were also bordering Italy. Lombardy was uh, just across uh, the Alps. Uh, Milan was, as we've seen in different videos, I, I have something, as you know. Uh, in coming about exactly this period as far as the regional series is concerned about the Ambrosian city um, developed uh, an important ecclesiastical uh, prestige uh, during the centuries so the, 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 the Lombard church uh, had in many ways its own relevance uh, separated from the one of Ravenna and, and Rome right? the, the latter had naturally affirmed without uh, coming backs at this point and possibilities or, or interest of course of doing so uh, its own monarchy and so the ecumenic uh, rule over the entire Christendom so things were getting in fact um, sort of heated at, at those levels where powerful archbishops were not so used at least to recognize so immediately uh, that degree uh, of papal authority. Um, the Swabians were legitimately seeing themselves not just as very powerful and again legitimized by this election in Milan. This is the interesting thing that as here we're talking about essentially the Roman election, right? So the, the German rulers, as you know, will be crowned kings of Germany and then kings of the Romans and, and eventually and hopefully they would have had to go to Rome to be crowned Italic kings and uh, Holy Roman Emperors. Um, the fact that Milan played such an important role also in German politics uh, at this level essentially of backing as, as a vassal because that was the point as far as the imperial throne was concerned yes there was some um, Germanness in, in the Romanity of the election as far as the again that sort of would be a Holy Roman Imperial status that normally was conferred, in fact, in, uh, in, in Aachen, was concerned. But, in fact, the, the imperial ecumenic level, especially within this uh, axis that had form, been forming between Germany, Italy, uh, Burgundy, and Bohemia, was concerned, um, revolved heavily around, especially the more developed areas of, of the empire, in fact, they were uh, northern Italy, northern central Italy, southern Germany, that were to be seen, in fact, as a hopeful bridge, right, just from uh, that was properly the imperial uh, road from, from Germany to Rome that should have facilitated, in fact, the, the policy of a Holy Roman Emperor. And so the Swabians, just by geographical location, were advantaged. But they also were expression of, in fact, one of the most developed heirs in Germany. I made a video about medieval Swabia, if you're interested in the original series. Uh, as much as one about um, the Duchy of Saxony, which was instead like the opposite of that, was, um, if you want, at this point, still leaving a bit of the legacy of um, of the Ottonian monarchy, and would do so until the, the beginning of the 13th century, but this was an era where it was more difficult to centralize, where, um, yes, there was an important expansion, but not as much as the resources that could sustain some sort of Alpine state, right? Um, state of control, 
right? That eventually the Hohenstaufen, especially, would pursue also in the direction of southeastern Germany, not just southwestern Germany when they were located. The Rhineland was close together with the, I mean, just in the north with the major uh, cities of the empire, and in fact, the crown in the electing uh, seas, right? So this contrast it would leave on between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, the Welfen and the Weiblinger, at least Weiblinger, I mean, as the Swabian, the Hohenstaufen war cry, um, was revolving around, in fact, the, the rivalry between Swabia Franconia, let's say, and uh, uh, Saxony Bavaria, at least because for dynastic reasons we will see now, and they were fairly complicated, um, the the Bavarian uh, and and the Saxons had uh, been uh, controlled by, by, by had been ruled by the wealth uh, the development dynasty, but it was not so immediate. Like you could always sort of reject them in a bit in the same way the the German election worked. And I made a video about um, the Duchy of Bavaria as well. If you're interested uh, in that story, right? Um, there was an old issue as well. So we've seen the Hohenstaufen claim now as kings, anti-kings, to Lothar of Samplenburg, the Alodia, uh, con- belonged to, to Henry V, that were not of immediate access or control. There was naturally a big deal, again, of privatization, of sort of uh, the destabilization of, of the system. In fact, until Frederick II, and basically the deal between the, the Ollenstaufen and the Welfen would not really be settled. We talk often about Frederick, a lot, made lots of videos about him. You can check out, I have a, uh, a Hohenstaufen playlist. But there was an older, uh, uh, an, in many ways, even a more important issue. That was the Matildine inheritance. right? In other words, those claims over the uh, heritage, uh, the patrimony, all, that Matilda of Canossa had uh, at some point first um, uh, given to the to the Roman Church, and eventually, through an agreement uh, following 1111, to the Salian Henry V. Right? We never talked about Matilda. It's an incredibly interesting figure, and the, the history around her is, is is amazing as far as this imp- whole imperial conne- uh, Roman imperial connections were concerned. Just imagine this noble woman being born literally, I think, around like in the 40s of the 11th century. So having literally seen the war change it completely, especially as far as the Italian dimension was concerned, the there was still an Atonian aura to some to some extent. The Salians were there already, but the Normans, in a way, had had yet to arrive. Um, the there hadn't been crusades nor the papal reforms, and she lived through all this and gathering an immense uh, patrimony that stretched. Basically, from the Alpine foothills to to central Italy, to Tuscany, uh, and beyond, and that controlled basically the single most important valleys, passages, roads, locks, uh, and and castles, including the very famous one of Canossa um, uh, itself, necessary obviously to the German Raumfahrt, right? And um, this um, at the extinction of the countess had brought to an immense deal of contrast between the Pampas and the Empire that were historically already battling themselves since the 8th century over who had the right to control what as far as um, properly the, as we've seen with investiture controversy um, and mostly what this, the, the central northern Italian territories were, were concerned a mostly in intricate matter that again I have to make very in-depth videos on and tens of ones to 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 really and plastically um, uh, expose right explain uh, all together. But that to, to make the long story short, always um, uh, essentially influenced the and uh, the the negotiate the negotiations between the Papacy and Empire at every. Um, Romfart at every German expedition uh, in the peninsula because those, say, th- these people let's say these areas were heavily populated right, and were very productive and they constituted again some major strategic assets 
um, in, in Western Europe um, for the imperial policy to, to properly be carried out in the first place. So in spite of the superimposition of certain, uh, of some of them, nor Conrad's Italic crowning, nor his claims on the Matildic possessions would, however, make him prevail in Germany, right? There were, again, valid ideas. Like, again, the, the Italic crown was technically even more important than the German one as far as uh, the Holy uh, Roman Imperial Authority was concerned because without the latter, you could not be elected as Holy Roman Emperor, even if you had you were king of the Romans and... Um, German king. So you necessarily must have that. In that sense, Conrad had it. But it didn't have the German one, right? Or at least there had been, to make the thing more complicated, naturally, there had been many vassals but everywhere that had supported him as opposed to Lothar of Sapplenburg. Um, also, the concept that, again, uh, the Mathildic possessions had somehow uh, uh, in fact been inherited by uh, by Conrad as a dynastic legacy of Henry V that the Oenstaufen could could boast um, was uh, somehow uh, a matter of first of all having the force of intervening in Italy not just to be crowned but properly in force and uh, able especially to have contacts in Rome um, and support there to, to be to be elected right. In any case, Lothar of Sapplenburg was had been the the catalyst, basically, of all the opposition to uh, the, the Salians back in the day. As we've seen, they had the support of the German clergy, as well as essentially the, the same one of the Pope in Rome. So those were more important cards, right? He was better, sort of, uh, you know, established uh, in northern Germany. Yes, this was a limit again, as far as the Italian policy was concerned. But at the same time, uh, it was from Germany that an expedition to the peninsula could be organized in order to reclaim that wall, Holy Roman Imperial issue. So when, in 1130, Conrad uh, came back to Germany from Italy, he surely took a stand against Lothar, but there wasn't much that he could quite achieve or profit from that. Uh, north of the Alps, right? Again, there were two parties, there were two sides scattered across the, the entire empire, but overall, Lothar was stronger. He, there was an hour of legitimacy there that um, received the greater support um, in, overall. However, Pope Honorius II died exactly in 1130, producing a schism between the successor Innocent II and the antipope Anacletus II, right? This was a product of cardinal um, split, right? Where th that division existed also in the, uh, in the papal curia, obviously. And remember that cardinals at this point have a, a real institutional role. Uh, as you know, for the papal election um, that did not exist until the Gregorian reforms, at least it had never been formalized to that degree. And none of them naturally was trying to, let's say, support one of the other in, uh, let's say, trying trying to, to, to undo the papal reforms, the conquered that of arms. No, it had nothing to do with that. As cardinals, they were incredibly aware of their, of their power and privilege stemming from that. Uh, but of course, they were, as individual characters, the expression of different forces, right? Uh, perhaps even more importantly, what really um, was causing a fracture in, in the church at that point were the two rival main um, uh, families of, of Rome, the Frangipani, who had supported Innocent II, and the Pier Leone that instead had uh, upheld Anacletus. And as long as Rome was engulfed in this situation, it was ever more complicated to arrange an imperial election in the Europe's. 
and even more importantly, it was the antipope Anacletus that prevailed in Rome, um, to the point that Innocent took refuge in France. Um, at this point, he um, uh, was um, actually supported by uh, a local council that uh, spoke, pronounced itself in, in, in his favor, uh, and um, thanks also to the contribution of Bernard of Clairvaux, just uh, to speak about um, illustrious contemporaries of these stories. Lothair had essentially supported Innocent, and uh, this um, blessing also from the, the Western Frankish kingdom prompted him to descend into Italy his first time, right? Uh, he would support uh, Innocent's prerogatives and trying to uh, enter uh, Rome, or at least to, to, to see what the situation was there, because he fundamentally remained in Lombardy, which in, in itself was quite split, and this was essentially the most important area, right, of the entire system, because we will see it later, even though today we talk mostly about the eastern part um, of northern Italy, uh, but uh, again, we will talk abundantly about this regarding Milan, etc. Was of course booming like hell. Again, the the, the largest city in the empire was Milan at this point, um, already something like one hundred thousand uh, inhabitants. It, it rival with with uh, Paris, but there were also other large important cities uh, in the Po Valley that um, were essentially battling with one another and that sort of main uh, divide between essentially the Milanese supporters and those who wanted to counter the, the larger city was forming. For example, Milan at this point was at odds with Crema. It's actually very close uh, to the same land here. I made, I think in the very early days of Schwerpunkt, a video talking about the 12th century Milanese expansion at this point in history. It's quite fascinating. Again, hopefully we'll get um, soon uh, into that in, in, in detail. Generally speaking, Milan was siding with the more sort of autonomistic um, part of the empire, as far as especially the, the Italic uh, cities were, were concerned. This had been evident during uh, the Patari. Again, Milan was essentially exhibiting a, a, a Guelphism, even though it's an anachronistic term, so to be precise. Um, as a consequence, however, Lothair was opposed by Milan and the uh, close city of Crema in the south uh, east. I made a video about the 12th century uh, Milanese expansion at very early very early days of Schwerpunkt, explaining a bit um, this first half of the 12th century, especially what the deal really was, because in the other, it was mostly about fighting uh, Frederick Barbarossa, or at least, you know, readjusting after that. Uh, Lothair, however, received um, the allegiance of Pavia, that was, by the way, also the uh, canonic, but not just the capital of the Italic, Kingdom, and also, in fact, the place where the Italic crowning would, would normally take place, Cremona, that, as we will see, was essentially threatened by Milan, uh, and, uh, Piacenza, and other cities. All right, so that, again, were fully aware and actually proud of their of being imperial subjects, just like the Milanese really were. I mean, there was no. Uh, kind of secessionist, and nobody would reason like in, in those terms at the time. Um, it was, however, a matter of internal politics, as we've seen. The same Conrad had been crowned in Milan, and uh, paradoxically, again, it was uh, at that point about opposing the strongest candidate, not the one that was just across the Alps, like Conrad in Swabia, for example. Um, but again, also the politics of these cities is, is quite complicated. It's not that easy or monofactorial, a few polyfactorial, uh, as um, as I'm illustrating now for, for the sake of, of brevity. Lothair was accompanied by Pope Innocent, 
uh, he managed from Lombardy to reach Rome, where he succeeded, in spite of the local uh, issues, to be crowned Holy Roman Emperor in 1133. As during other Holy Roman Imperial crownings, something very typical was happening, that actually much of the city of Rome herself was in the hands of the newly crowned uh, political opponents. This is uh, the case as Anacletus, as Antipope, was really controlling great part of the herbs. There were uh, fights, of course, throughout this period, made uh, a bit about uh, really the, the turbulence of uh, Rome during this period, uh, which also brought, made a video about medieval Lazio, first of all, but um, also one properly about the papal courier uh, itinerancy in towns around Rome that were sort of also coalizing to curb actually what was an impressive commune, um, the, the Roman one, potentially, that would, however, historically be gradually put down uh, in its autonomy by the um, uh, by the papal seigniory, as such. But uh, Rome also was a large city for the time standards, aside from the universal, uh, sacred, in fact, Im imperial Catholic relevance that it had in the deepest traditional sense. Um, and we sort of overlooked that during medieval times because, hey, it's the Middle Ages, what does this have to do with the continuity, with, but also with the Roman past? Um, people just mentioned the, the Avignonese so-called captivity as a you know, as the, ah, look at Rome, was just 30,000 inhabitants, what a terrible, actually Rome was, remained a, you know, pretty irrelevant um, center to say the least in the entire Christendom, also beyond uh, her religious uh, relevance and, and the papacy as such, right, for, for many reasons that today we don't, we do not digress on, but I think we will have to make a video properly about medieval Rome, as a wall, then I already made something actually about it. We will keep doing so. Uh, there is a, a playlist that I created for touristic purposes, which is in fact like titled like the history of the herbs or the eternal city or something like that. And I um, have started from a couple of years, a uh, sort of mini series that overlaps with the others regarding properly the, the history of the city of Rome, not just the say, the contingental history of the city, like in videos like these that are dedicated to, to something else. But it's important to, to stress the centrality of the herbs still at this point. Also, one um, important factor in this schism was the secular Norman support of the antipope Anacletus, right? A few videos about the secular Normans. I know we have to catch up. With that, but to make the long story short, the Norman ruler Roger II of Sicily and Apulia was backing, in fact, just from southern Italy, even the, the militias that were opposing uh, Lothar's crowning. In this case, the guy had had the upper hand and managed at least to have himself crowned Holy Roman Emperor, and that was in many ways uh, enough just from a political, moral point of view, aside from any control, as, as we will see that now was quite. Uh, lose actually after his um, demise, right? Um, uh, in any case, also at this point, there was between Lothar and Innocent the unsolved issue of the Matildic lands, right? That were even a, say a greater problem than you can think when you realize that these were allodial in nature, that as we have seen in the videos about seigneurial Europe basically means that were within the um, legal customs of the times, fundamentally untouchable, even against the Romano-Germanic um, public universal ideal that in theory everything that um, laid in the, within the kingdom uh, and the territory was, was a, a king's property, really, uh, the, the, the highest authority property, the emperor's property. So even though uh, Lothar and Innocent had been backing each other to pursue their own goals, um, they, the, the, the rivalry between the Emperor and, and the Papacy was, was still there, especially about this, this Matildic possessions. 
They came to an agreement for which Lothar recognized the rights of the patrimonium Sancti Petri over these properties. Uh, so in our ways, uh, going against the deal that Matilda had made uh, in her later life with Henry V, that, as we've seen, had been the same Lothar's opponent. However, in exchange for this, Lothar asked a revenue, right, um, uh, an annuity, basically, uh, that the Pope granted him to be paid from Matilda's vassals, so it was a form of power sharing that, in the formal sense, was was actually just pushing the problem uh, further away. But again, both Lothar and in in Innocent had sort of more pressing political problems at the moment in order to just fight against one another in a full-fledged way, right? So all this expedition naturally entails, uh, according to the imperial practice, that the um, the universal ruler would have to leave some officials to control the uh, various chunks of the Italic kingdom. So when uh, Lothair came back to Germany, he had left um, some representatives, especially in the Tuscan Mark, that had been the center of uh, the Canossa's power. They were properly the, the, the Markians, of, the, of, of, of Tuscany. You could make a video specifically about that uh, polity, uh, even though at this point it was sort of melting away under the push of the communes, but never underestimate how much actually the feudal skeleton of Italy still remained, and there was some actual pulp uh, in that, as we will see now better uh, as well. The, same, the representatives were left uh, in control of also the, the allodial lands of, of Matilda, again, that, that straddled uh, across uh, central and northern Italy, uh, all across the Po Valley, the, again, the, at the, up to the Alpine foothills, so the, the most crucial river crossings, etc., that were absolutely needed, even just for Lothar to, to come back to Germany in the first place, and to have arrived um, to Rome uh, the other way. Um, in 1136, Lothar um, was asked once again to come back to Italy. So the situation had remained fairly like, uh, okay, we have still to adjust things, and of course these expeditions required years of preparation. But overall, they expressed this uh, will of con continuity in Italian politics from from the side of, of Lothar in this case. Uh, the Pope, in particular, was worried, again, about the power of Roger II. And the Siculo Normans are experiencing, at this point, one of the highest powers. In I mean, Roger II embodies, the, if you want, the peak of, of um, uh, Norman Sicilian power. Uh, historically, uh, the, the, the Siculo Norman realm was... One of, by far one of the most advanced, actually the single most centralized in, in Latin Germanic Europe, uh, even more than, than England. Uh, and the proximity to Rome, even though it had been in part wanted by the papacy that had transformed this realm into a vassal, right, just to, even for being established as a kingdom, even though the Normans had initially installed themselves violently and also against um, the Pope, right, to be given that, that privilege, in a way, was still, in fact, very close to Rome. Uh, the Normans had even sacked Rome during these issues with emperors, like entering Rome, and then the Normans coming back, similar things. It's impressive how resilient, in this sense, Rome really was. Again, that attestment of the fact it was a, actually a massive system that nobody could quite directly controlled, nor, nor, the, nor the papacy, I, I, we're talking the city, the, the incredibly violent baronial factions of Rome that were always particularly troublesome and, and, um, and rough. Uh, they had militarized and fortif fortified the entire city within it, from the within. That was the actual landscape of Rome. You can't see it in contemporary Rome, 
right? There is a few of that, but it, it's like one of the, the medieval Rome has passed in terms of landscape and actual uh, um, urban system. Um, so the idea was calling Lothar again to um, to contain the Sicula Normans and perhaps even carrying out an expedition in southern Italy in their own in their own land, right? So Lothair entered Italy, and so of course from the north he had to deal first with the Lombard affairs uh, as the universal ruler, public authority, king of Italy, etc. He acted in function of judge and arbiter of the disputes between the Lombard cities, especially Milan and Cremona, as the former wanted to take over the latter, at least eat part of its territory. Um, and this was all happening under the edges of Innocent II, as well as a broader, you know, spiritual authority next to the to the to the lay one. Uh, universally. Lothair held a diet in Roncaglia in the very heart of, of the Po Valley, so facilitating the say the, the dialogue between all the cities. He issued, interestingly enough, a feudal law that regulated the relations between the client vassals and their lords and the uh, the the meaning of this law was stressing the rights of the lords over their vassals, right? So in, in turn, the obligations of such lords towards the same empire. In other words, what, there was an attempt, which would be pursued also by the Hohenstaufen, as you know, later to reestablish some sort of uh, feudal hierarchy, order, um, in spite of the uh, incredible development of the communal autonomy and power that was basically taking over the one of the same feudality, right? And as you know, everything was being... I mean, it's not that the communes were were not having figures or characters that were not feudal in their way. I mean, they, they compenetrated each other, right? There's nothing classist about this. It's um, It's about choosing, even as a as an aristocrat, whether you wanted to uh, side with the growing communal um, liberties that at this point were within the, the, the consular regime that we discussed on multiple occasions, hence probably the equivalent of the feudal one in terms of military class and you know professionalism and, and political power, or in fact the imperial hierarchy. Uh, so in, in a feudal, in a more rural Direction, even though, uh, of course, there was no coming back. It was just like, from the imperial side, trying to co-opt certain figures, putting them at the hand of sort of larger feudal districts, trying to recompact that uh, original force in, in order to to curb these communes that must have been very impressive to witness, especially from from a land like Germany that didn't quite have um, at all, especially this. Uh, novelty embodied by Milan that would literally take over the, the, the district, like this This is what other communes were, were already doing a bit on its own, in spite as we will see now, the continuity of episcopal power, and so the bishop counts that the emperor somehow controlled, but not entirely depended on whose, say, bishopric that was, and all these investiture controversies, popes, anti-popes uh, issues were rising evenly, but especially the fact that the communes now wanted to take over each other, right, that Milan had the capacity to expand, to wage war uh, at, at uh, an importantly large range, that were leagues that were being formed to support that or counter that, and so all things that um, would have been uh, particularly evident at the time of Frederick Barbarossa in, in all their, their military might. Lothair, um, in, in this sense, uh, made a good impression, meaning that probably he didn't have much of the capacity to really, uh, again, invert this phenomenon, nor the the communal and feudal, um, let's say, um, 
developments were so so much at odds with one another. It wasn't like a cracking point, like all involved. But I mean, also the communes existed normally in the traditional um, customs, right, of, uh, of law and politics. But again, the, the main aim of this guy was southern Italy. So, in in the north, he really behaved as a as a good. At least he made a very good display as a as an Italic king, uh, uh, display of remarkable authority. But his point was organizing the expedition uh, against Roger II, as the Pope had demanded. And today we focus mostly on the Italic kingdom, so there would be a lot to say regarding uh, the Siculo Normans at this point, the fact that they were allied with the Byzantines. So there was actually all of Mediterranean policy that Lothar was pursuing, aside from Lombardy, Tuscany, Rome, etc. Uh, nevertheless, again, they these had a remarkable weight in this affair. See, they, you couldn't, again, uh, wage war against the, the Normans in southern Italy without having secured southern Germany at least, um, the, in fact, all these various layers, northern Italy, central Italy, etc., right? So it was, think about that, right? If you're cut out, um, if you're cut off from your supply lines, etc., it, it starts becoming something extremely um, difficult to cope with um, across this, that distance. Um, he, um, Lothar led the expedition together with his son-in-law, Henry the Proud, which was um, a, a Belf, right, for the powerful house of the Belfin, and Duke of Bavaria, right? And the Imperials really invaded southern Italy, right? This occurred in 1137. But there was, at this point, a um, an issue between the same papacy and the empire regarding what kind of status would have some, I mean, the lands conquered in southern Italy, and especially the the Abbey of Monte Cassino that was historically like a deep purple thing in many ways that evidently the Germans were thinking like, we, we want to control more, we want to have a greater grip in this territory, uh, and especially against, you're fighting here against uh, a kingdom like the one of Sicily, that technically is not part of the Holy Roman Empire, but it's a papal vassal. So here, all the sort of uh, issues were, were emerging again back into, like, if this land is conquered by Holy Roman Emperor, does it become Holy... Roman imperial territory, and if so, does this how how does this work? Or is or or is it a, a papal territory that is just being subcontracted feudally to someone else? Um, you you could not really ignore those things, uh, even during a military campaign, because politically, like how do you cope practically with this with the occupation, the conquest, and so on? There was also another worry from the side of the Pope, which was, in fact, um, still concerned with the increasing power of the German presence um, in Italy and uh, the, the broader one in the empire and it was the consolidation of Henry the Proud's power because the guy controlled um, thanks to, to Lothair uh, uh, both Saxony and Bavaria because he was actually Duke of both and uh, at this point and he had received also the Tuscan mark as well as the uh, the aforementioned revenue from the Alodia lands of Mathilda. So this was like all very fluid, as you understand, as a mechanism, but this means essentially a super state with massive control, some of the major assets in Germany, in Italy, uh, and now with the possibility even of, of, of these guys gaining more power even in southern Italy. So in many ways, this, the, the same nightmare that that uh, the papacy always had regarding, you know, being uh, taken by a pincer movement from, from the north and the south or having a too oppressive emperor that pushes from the north and so you need the, uh, the Normans from the south to intervene at, at Similia, right? So just this just for highlighting 
actually how similar, actually identical, the imperial policy was regardless of, of dynasty concerning Rome, the Mediterranean, uh, and beyond, right? The, the, the idea is that the Swabians were the guys who were too much into this uh, Mediterranean chimera and they lost it all. This was a very popular position in 19th century um, Germany. We, we talk about this, uh, especially the nationalistic perspectives. Ah, no, it was this northerners, it was the lands of Saxony, the rougher, but sort of less less uh, spoiled that would expand towards the east and, uh, and the Baltic and whatever. Actually, this is true for Lothar of Saplenburg, this is true for Otto of Brunswick, uh, these Saxon rulers, the first thing they do when they come, they become monarchs is exactly the same thing. Rome. The Mediterranean. That's the only thing. Right? And you do not know better than a 12th century German monarch what, what his best options really were. It sort of makes sense at, at so many levels that I will not repeat myself yet again. There is a massive um, playlist a bit about... Uh, the Holy Roman Empire, also medieval Germany, the Renovatsu Imperio, so you know why that would have been the more advantageous thing. But it's fascinating to observe how, even though this was actually the last uh, presence of, uh, the last moment of um, of Conrad, uh, excuse me, of, of uh, Lothar in Italy, and that you have to wait essentially for Frederick Barbarossa um, decades later, to, to come back as a as a sound imperial power, how much still the like the bridge between the Ottonians, the Salians, the the Swabians really was trying to do the same thing. Uh, it's really fascinating. As a result of the aforementioned quarrels between the papacy and and the emperor, the aforementioned expedition into southern Italy was aborted. Right, Lothar at that point returned to Germany, uh, relatively scorned, and he died, in fact, north of the Alps in 1137. Right, he had designated Henry the Proud as his successor. They would have continued what his uncle had uh, paid um, him the way for. Yet his position was very credible and uh, a threat, definitely, for the papacy. But also for the German electors that objectively, again, look at this guy who controlled kind of half of Germany, or at least was capable of hegemonizing that the kind of scale, plus all the rights in Italy. That was massive, right? Um, this brought up, again, in contrast, the, uh, the power, the, the political f fortune of Conrad of Hohenstaufen, right? Consider that the guy had uh, the guy's brother, essentially Frederick. I mean, he was named Frederick, very Frederick Barbarossa's father had also concurred. Like he had competed for the German election. Eventually, he was he lost an eye during a siege, so that made him uh, legally unfit to become emperor. So he had sort of taken the reins of this, and he had been waiting, in fact, for the. The good, um, the good, a good chance to represent itself. After all, he had been, as we've seen, elected as anti-king. Uh, he had succeeded also in having himself recognized as such in Germany, not just uh, in Italy, as we've seen. Um, subs uh, consequently, Conrad and Henry entered in. Um, contra contrast with one another, right? This brought essentially to the passage, I mean, at the death of Lothar, to the election of what we consider, in fact, Conrad III, that, however, uh, w would have considered himself king from before, like, according to his own uh, computation, right? So Henry was... Um, was put aside, at least, from... Uh, by, the, by the German electors, right? And... As a consequence, Conrad stripped him of his German duchies, Saxony and Bavaria, as we've seen. Henry died, suddenly again uh, making uh, it possible for 
Conrad to essentially maintain his uh, monarchy in uh, in Germany and to reclaim the Italian one as well. But the latter would uh, uh, never materialize itself uh, in practice. Uh, there were other things going on, as we were pointing out, before he wouldn't be able to be crowned Holy Roman Emperor. The Matildic possessions were, of course, once again uh, claimed through his uh, current connection with Henry V. So everything that had belonged to Lothair, Henry the Proud, was at this point coming back, at least on paper, on parchment at this point, uh, in, um, in, in Conrad's uh, possession. There were issues with Conrad's uh, government as well. In fact, the Staufe appointed, uh, being possibilitated to um, to move to Italy because the German issues were, were really big at that point. So we'll see it better at another point. But he sent some some uh, some go governors. Right. For example, the, Tus the Tuscan mark was entrusted to Ulrich of Atomo, which made that land uh, practically uncontrollable by Conrad. Right. Ulrich uh, acted as sort of an autonomous ruler, and uh, he mm, essentially lent himself to the flatteries of this or that commune, so missing the the orders, the, the point of what was coming from north of the Alps. The same was happening in the northeast, in the Mark of Verona. I made a video about medieval Verona as a well. It's not about the Mark, but it de facto came to overlap, as we will see now, with, uh, with territory, like the commune was very powerful, and that was really important because um, Verona, of course, con controls the the Adige Etch Valley, and as such, the most important pass um, from uh, from the north, from from Germany, and it was crucial just to control that. It would create a great advantage to to Barbarossa as the Veronese. Uh, during his uh, first expedition, blocked his way back to, to Germany, uh, violently so. Um, the Veronese mark had been entrusted to Hermann, the Margrave of Baden, and uh, he basically acted very autonomously as well. So again, the German affairs never allowed Conrad to go to Italy, in spite of having de facto won his um, wrestling with Lothar regarding also his, his Italian rights. There was also no possibility of uh, involving himself as a consequence against Roger of Sicily, in spite of the fact that he was strengthening his position, uh, supported by the Byzantines that did not want Conrad to, to in fact consolidate his power because from Germ here we are approaching properly the peak of German power during the Middle Ages that is under Frederick Barbarossa in the second half and uh, I made a video about M Manuel Comnenus that talks about this because he was quite involved in fact in that kind of balance uh, the Germans had a great leverage not just on Italy but um, so potentially, like, uh, securing also the southern Italian ports, becoming a threat to the Byzantines, but also Central Europe, right? That, in fact, during the Second Crusade was still the preferential route um, of the of the Crusaders. The same corridor would pass there, and, you know, the, the Byzantines, as you know, were always freaked out when these crusading armies passed by Constantinople. Uh, we will see the Second Crusade uh, in its... Um, with uh, at some other point, so all these issues made it impossible for Conrad to to dedicate himself to even the Holy Roman Imperial his uh, Holy Roman Imperial crowning, right? Um, the shame of Odessa, 
the Second Crusade was a disaster, as you know, mostly because of the poor relations between the French and the Germans that sort of mishandled the situation. The Byzantines were not quite cooperative, as usual, and there are lots of other issues going on. Frederick Barbarossa notoriously was with his uncle during that expedition, and uh, the Second Crusade represents uh, uh, also an attempt of the European monarchs to claim back sort of the control of the Christian divisions, if you want. Like the the First Crusade had been launched by the Pope, uh, directing the, the, this barons as vassals of the other kings that were in part just not participating because either they were excommunicated or were fighting against one another. So there was an anxiety from the side of the Western and the Eastern Frankish emperors, uh, ru um, rulers in uh, in um, in the first place, to uh, reacquire control on these military expeditions, right? And the interesting thing is that when the crusade was over, Conrad was actually preparing for an Italian expedition, but he died suddenly in February 1152. Uh, so nothing was done of that. The uh, next expedition would be the one of his successor and nephew, uh, Frederick, in uh, 1154. Right, the first of many, right under his his uh, reign. One of the consequences of this was predict that predictably, after the departure of Lothar III, the Germanic control over the Kingdom of Italy went downhill fast, right. Um, this uh, this was normal as the, the the communes were ramping up their prerogatives was again lot of of manpower and resources like in, in the land to to build up this quite solid uh, territorial dominions that would in fact uh, entrench themselves enough to to prevent the uh, the Swabian emperors to effectively take over. Uh, the, the region later and so failing also in uniting east and west through that because again take Lombardy it's, it's done right and then from there you can't the it would have been possible just to to take over the the entire Mediterranean and ruling from there right as, a, as opposed to Germany that was actually the, the 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 ultimate purpose of all these Germanic rulers in the first place there would be a lot to say about this, it, it, it's one of the most fascinating um, topics, in if not the most, at least in, in a strictly political sense, in um, medieval history. Um, and again, Italy is a quite complex uh, country. Uh, you have different places uh, essentially doing the same autonomization but with their own specific characteristics even though there is a significant homogeneity in the communal expansion particularly but there is for example the papacy right the regions that stretch from Ferrara and uh, Ravenna so the, the Romagnol area to the same Lazio uh, the, the province of Rome um, well the popes of course are happy to be a bit more on their own, yes, again, the, the Normans were, there were other deals with, with the Norman kingdom taking place. This, these were still sort of aggressive-minded in their ways, but again, different alliances in, in the Levant, in, uh, you know, within the same Europe, were, were changing, trying to, to balance out things. The Alpine passes, as well, were from, from the Italian side, as we've seen, presided over, there was an increase in territorial control, over the, all these routes, right? And the sense here, as we will explain now, is that the decline in feudal power, or at least its urbanization, its communalization, and also, in fact, the absorption of ecclesiastical power within the same communes, was, of course, uh, eroding that, few, in fact, the traditional system that the empire had relied on the Vesalatic beneficiary one in the absence of a of a central state to control even uh, if uh, just after I mean during this this uh, these expeditions from the north to, to, to recontrol this, this territory. So the the main deal in the Italic Kingdom indeed, and we will see it again 
uh, it hopefully uh, soon, was the Milanese expansion in Lombardy, especially in the northwestern sector of it, but de facto as the um, hegemonizing power, not quite the hegemonic one, but yet, but still pointing aggressively and quite, um, you know, um, stubbornly toward that direction. That, of course, made a lot of sense. Uh, we're talking about, again, the, the largest city in Europe together with, with Paris, uh, a massive uh, commercial, but also military development. Its politics, its um, economy was really um, uh, extending to that control, especially of the Italic communications. Milan being in the very center, I mean, from, from between Germany, France, um, Central Italy, uh, the east, the, down the, the Po River, Venice, etc. So it, 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 it's, it's that crucial place that you know it's going to develop fast if left without this, um, you know, uh, say, exaction or control, especially its aggressiveness against its, its neighbors, right? The Milanese waged a war against Como in the north that was uh, in fact pretty close to Swabia we've seen in that video about from Dacia to Duke Dome the Swabian case of which the, the Bishop of Como would, would be entrusted by Frederick Barbarossa because of, of the in fact the relevance that the the northern passes um, the uh, Tallinn Valley as a matter of fact would constitute for for uh, for the Swabian expedition uh, into Lombardy, right, some territory probably that belonged to the um, historically to Alamannia, to, to the Swabian territories, and that, that was something that disturbed deeply the, the Swabian nobility, that, that it was so entrenched in its own privileges that even if the Duke of Swabia was the Holy Roman Emperor, and actually the, the most powerful guy in Europe, um, they could afford to, to see that land returned. Uh, and the Milanese were really just going for it like they were saying okay if uh the of course there was a also a, a commercial interest uh, there were lots of traffics passing from there but there was also a legitimate a strategic interest in saying having some control this was not so strong like um the veronese on the adige valley for example but it was still a way of saying like let's try to to gain as much control as we can of the northern uh ways because that's where the, the Germans are going at some point, not necessarily or preferably to come from, but, you know, they, they could uh, attack us from there. Um, uh, this was a lake region, as you know, this famous lake Como. It also was quite important uh, economically. Milan was pointing at the same Pavia, that is to say, the, the old capital of the Italic, that is the Longobard Kingdom. Um, which is strategically located almost at the confluence of the Ticino and Po rivers in, in the south um, of Milan and relatively close. I mean, these this districts were not uh, particularly large, but they were overloaded, again, in, in, in population and resources. And that this attrition much more like the, the sense of uh, of competition between each other to the possibility of this communes basically taking uh, each other over it was quite, quite concrete, especially looking at the the armies that Milan and her allies were able to put together, and also the, the ones of the least that would fight against them. Um, in this situation, however, the most prelibate prey for Milan would have been Cremona, that I made actually a video on. It was a staunchly Ghibelline city, uh, in many ways, I mean, in their own ways, the Lombards had always the sense of autonomy. We were seen in, in the in the very coat of arm of, of Cremona that there is the, the episode that was sort of, you know, a provocation against imperial power because these guys thought that they were the empire. They had a deep sense of their uh, sort of the Longobard uh, control of, of the Roman Imperium to some extent. But in this case, Milan was really threatening this powerful city that was very had a very rich countryside and all, and yet was smaller than Milan uh, in the southeast, uh, all but a bit more distant, several tens of, of, of kilometers. Um, but this makes it uh, makes the 
the, the, the Milanese ascendancy over the, the region even more evident, right? There is uh, an ambition here to take over everything that stretches from the lakes in the foothills of the Alps to the middle of the Po River. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty huge area. It's what historically Milan would, would expand uh, along, all right? And nobody basically was able to, to curb them in this, not even em the emperors. So each commune had its own government that would historically develop towards a, a statal direction. Uh, the Italian communes had a pretty uniform institutional system, the one of the consul, we were talking about before again I made multiple videos on this topic um, this was again very very militarized like very aggressive minded these were the same the, the militas the knights essentially of the kingdom that were um, some could be knighted others not like the milas is not an equivalent of knight I often use this say to make the story simple but you know in order to be a knight you have to be dubbed it has to be some sort of um, universal recognition of sort could, these were true knights in everything but the, uh, the Italian communes recruited the, their heavy cavalry on a sensual basis right so if you were rich enough right especially at this point the system was close enough to the feudal war to to, to have lots of properly old style aristocratic um, military professionals able to do so right later on you would have also the merchants but this was already happening in many ways. I mean, just people were very rich that not necessarily wanted to go at war, but that would and would actually militarize themselves as men at arms, even with great success, and or that had other people fighting in their stead. But um, at this point, again, everything is still pretty archaic, after all. Um, and the... Uh, the, the sense was that the, the consular regime was, was taking over not just the, not taking the reins of the communal government on behalf of the bishops, for example, very often, but also of the r rural lordships. This is something, in fact, that impressed deeply the Germans. When Frederick Barbarossa, when they arrived uh, in Lombard, they found, again, essentially these communal governments so that, that were born out of their own, right? They had given themselves a legitimacy, again, acting on behalf of the bishop count, so to remain within a sort of feudal hierarchy within the whole Roman Empire. But these were essentially just people who had not been entrusted power, if not by themselves, ruling over imperial vassals and having, in fact, much greater power than them. This was very, very much like a world upside down. Uh, especially from the perspective of those living north of the Alps they didn't have this kind of cities, this kind of government, this kind of mentality. You have, um, uh, in fact, a surpassing of the same dynastic concept. The idea is that all these houses sort of join in the communal government. Uh, they form alliances. They they do have territory on their own. They they are some cases holding proper feudal titles but at some point it's more convenient to, to most of them to just join the commune um, and you would have many other lordships still uh, around especially in the in the least urbanized areas um, at least the episcopal one would of course be centered uh, normally in the in the cities but it would be most, and I made a video about Asti and Aquileia that shows this, that sort of the least urbanized areas had preserved some sort of, not just more of lay um, feudal power, but also episcopal one. The, 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 the bishops were very powerful and sort of uh, the true landlords. This is the case, again, of Aquileia. If you have the video about medieval Friuli, you can check out, it's useful as well. There were some monastic lordships very rich monasteries um, made a video recently about the white mantle of churches in France and Italy and the, during the 11th century etc. This had been developing further. You have canonical lordships. Most of these would essentially be taken over by the communes de facto. Um, they were dispersed mostly throughout the, the, the countryside right and so 
the, the countryside in Italy is always controlled by the, the city, historically. You don't have the, the, I don't know, the world of the forest some, somewhere out there that, that leaves unbeknownst or sort of detached from these other mechanisms. No, the, the, the entire rural system revolves around the city. It is incredibly pervasive. Um, and this is witnessed, of course, by the size and power of, um, of the Italian cities the italic cities proper the normans had sort of ch been choking at least the the communal developments uh, of, of the otherwise florid southern italian cities um, and so it's in the center in the north of italy that these uh, cities are again in the absence of a strong imperial authority rising fast taking their the its place there was, again, a strict, very intimate cooperation, uh, but also identity between the communes and their dioceses. I mean, the idea that is that the bishops, as we were just saying, were very powerful. They had, as we'll see now, their own armies uh, within the city, together with the commune, right, that sort of, of course, had its own um, as well. And bishops were, in many cases retaining still their comital power again this is the one to which the communes decide that they they can expand in the countryside because they say we do it on behalf of our church of our diocese because that's what the episcopal power uh, endows us with sometimes there is a contrast between the bishop and the commune but often there is a unavoidable coexistence because they're both in the city uh, yet we're talking about very violent uh, interactions in, in many ways and of course there is a, an enormous rivalry between the, the various communes, hence also the various bishoprics in some way. They act on some different level, though. Um, the ancient uh, link between all the cities, right? It, it starts booming at this point. Uh, the fact that Milan was threatening the surrounding communes, such as especially in the case of Lodi, which is the one that would actually trigger the descent of Frederick Barbarossa next to the fact that, again, the Roman commune had kicked out the, the Pope, right, and had brought an heretic like Arnold of Brescia, we'll see him now, <laughs> was yet another story. But again, the, the Milanese presence in that sector of the Pope Valley was particularly crucial for the, the future of the imperial expeditions in the peninsula, so they had to, to control that tightly. Um, and Lodi, interestingly enough, uh, even though it was very exposed to Milan and uh, as very close and weaker than it, would eventually joined the Lombard League together with Milan against Frederick, Bar Frederick Barbarossa. When they realized what what eventually the Hohenstaufen's plan really were for them overall, um, there were other leagues were were forming. I mean, when we talk leagues, it's not just the uh, the Lombard one uh, or the Veronese one that will form against Frederick later on. They are, the, the actual alliances, the coordination between these cities. Again, the, the Po Valley is a flat land. You have all these districts. You have some sort of hydrographic uh, net that separates the various, um, that separates them uh, in some political and hist historical way. I mean, these were all cities founded by the Romans, or as we've seen, also, belong, of course, being previous centers, but that had maintained that Roman... Um, order and sort of administration and sort of uh, uh, cornerstone function in these this territories and that had always been existing uh, uninterruptedly from the ancient world uh, as the centers of power in the region right throughout the long the, the gods the long birds uh, the franks and so on uh, as a consequence they they had developed quite precociously uh great political uh, and strategic coordination among one another, right? Their, mo their, their favorite activity was during the season, devastating other communes' crops, taking some castle and occasionally engaging in some larger um, open field uh, clash. Uh, and of course, at this point, again, the, the most powerful communes were trying properly to hegemonize one another, the, the, the other ones. Uh, this is not exactly the video to, to deal with this in depth. Again, if you check my Medieval Italy or Medieval Italian Communes actually playlist, you will find the list of all these 
communes did the history of every single city that I find extremely fascinating. In fact, in this sort of 30 uh, communes uh, competition in many ways. But they were all very similar, but also very different in, in their own ways. Um, and that, I think it's quite useful to also methodologically approach history in the Middle Ages. So since we cannot cover the entire picture, I will stick just to northeastern Italy. That is also uh, sort of the underestimated area. Of course, it was less important than uh, the western Po Valley, but right, uh, it had its own communal development, it had also its feudal elements, it had its strategic relevance, um, and uh, we already made some... We talked Verona, we talked Padua, right, so others will have to come on this very basis. Um, so we can consider Bergamo already eastern Lombardy. Uh, it's actually very close to Milan, right? Um, and this the, the area that that, that uh, goes towards uh, say the richest Mantua, right? Uh, this is essentially um, central, actually. Uh, Lombard area, but it's in fact in between the dominance of Milan and the Mark of Verona, right? And it also it objectively has some sort of again uh, different different story. We're talking Brescia, in fact, the same Mantua. Um, the, the Garda Lake divides Verona and Brescia, right? Uh, west of Brescia, you have Bergamo, then you have Milan further west. That's the you see how the various uh, ballets like how it develops longitudinally uh, with Paul River running. This is the the, the left bank, of course, uh, between the Alps and uh, and the river. There is uh, here uh, some, of course, important communal autonomy and control over the rural areas as well. Right, there is a temporal power of the bishops. Brescia is particularly important in this mechanism because um, the city and the bishop start quarreling uh, more. Like when you have a weaker commune, you have like normally a stronger bishop. And at this point, you have we were in the 12th century. Heresies are ramping up dramatically, especially in areas like, in fact, northern Italy. Um, Languedoc, the Rhineland, right? So these are the moments of the most unhinged issues. Uh, we meant, we meant, uh, we we mentioned before Arnold of Brescia. That in fact, uh, I think I made a video on specifically back in the day. This guy was taken out at the time of, of Frederick Barbarossa, as he had basically gone over to Rome, uh, supporting the local commune against the Pope, etc. And the guy, in fact, contested openly, uh, contested openly ecclesiastical authority, right? Now, what is interesting, what I would like also to leave you with, with, a, with more clarity, is that we talk communes a lot, and it is definitely the case for this period. But technically, the communes developed in again a, a feudal world, in a feudal hierarchy, were at, at a district level. So the one of essentially the diocese and the and the city would have had to be in the hands of the commu uh, of the of the counts, right? And the communes are again subjugating this this um, lords. In part, these comital powers were held by the bishops, so it, it can be complicated. But there still were some feudal vassals, right? Properly nobiliar houses that were connected with the old. Um, nobility of, uh, again, uh, Longbird, uh, Frankish, Ottonian origin. And as we've seen, there were guys appointed, we've seen it even as far as south as, as the Duchy of Spoleto, like it were for until the 12th, 13th century, like coming from Germany, and just even autonomously so. Like they were re requested, there were enough connections between uh, the two sides of the Alps that would facilitate this process because if you weren't for one guy you were against him um, and so you would always have a counterpart that would come sort of help you or that you would found in this regard so um, 
when you look at the Brescian and the Mantuan territory, you realize that these um, the comital power had died in this case. In this more sort of central territories of the Po Valley, um, when uh, the when the Countess Mathilda had died, and she had held significant territories exactly in these areas, these waterways, these crossings, we're about to go over Nalo, near to Mantua, like these were, again, crucially strategical uh, areas for the for passing again from 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 Germany to, to, to Central Italy. They um, had uh, essentially taken over the situation. You have some sort of compromise with the establishment of a joint um, rule by the. Uh, it's as if the, the noblemen had established some some commune among their own. Um, you have the various branches of the Giselbertini counts that sort of cooperate to man, to maintain part of per, part of their status, uh, even if. Uh, Bergamo was also a community zone. Bergamo doesn't have a great deal of um, of um, of development. Um, the uh, Brescia is, is larger, Como is smaller, but it's also far north. Um, Bergamo has important. Uh, doesn't have so much social certification. It has even stronger infantry to some degree, but um, a nobility that comes mostly from from the rural areas. Uh, in our at least it maintains some greater uh i mean that definitely comes from there historically but maintains also some greater control on the on the countryside this is typical like the weaker the commune the greater the feudal power in the countryside right this comital uh once um survived like when you look at even particularly urbanized areas like i don't know florence in the 13th century you still have for example, the Guidi Counts, uh, you have, um, along the Apennine especially, you have the, the Montefeltro, the, the Malaspina, uh, etc. They're all sort of old-style, archaic, feudal, militaristic mentalities. It's something we have seen recently even for Savo, even, that, even though that, that was properly an important county and some sort of fact territorial state. Um, but that's the mentality, more connected to the imperial hierarchy and sort of seeking an opportunity to actually be put in control of some bigger area there, even later on at the head of some commune, like in the 13th century, the Hohenstaufen would do, opening in a way also to the development of the, the Italian seigneuries in the process. Um, and still also cooperating with the commune. I mean, it wasn't just a competition, it was mostly just a process for which uh, again, the the urbanization of the militas had taken place, right? They could, these guys could have possessions um, in the city as much as in the uh, in the in the countryside. I, I mean, every, all the also the militas of the city, the, the urban one, properly bred ones, were had this their land outside because that was the point. These guys tend to be emarginated in the more peripheral areas and being in this sense closer to sort of more uh, more, uh, more rural, decentralized um, a dimension that is in fact more distant from the city as well, so that explains it but it's also cooperative to some extent right, and it's very interesting to measure the, the fitness of a commune and its territorial control um, in order to uh, to appreciate properly the, 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 the power and, and, its, and the limits of the same of these communes historically uh, I, can, I can think about, about all the videos I could do just in, in line of principle about this um, this is true for northeastern Italy proper uh, like the Mark of Verona for example was witnessing the Marcus's authority weaken in favor of Verona specifically it was a bigger center um, but when you realize that Vuk ruled there and we saw that in the dedicated video realized that um, the powerful churches and the families descending from the counts did rule right it had urbanized to an extent uh, and you had in the broader mark 
the um because there is a curious phenomenon in, in this area that that is that this was the mark of verona but historically it, it, it will come to be known as the Trevisan mark which took the name after Treviso and was technically not a much of a mark anymore it was mostly like intended as a demarked as a geographical area but technically it was connected with this and in this area compared to Lombardy this is corresponding to the contemporary Veneto region roughly you have more feudal power surviving in spite of the, the existence of relevant communes where you have the counts um, of Vicenza of Padua of Treviso and also in the Verona area, you see the, the counts of uh, St. Boniface, the, the Gandalf things, that um, took properly on the character of noble dynasties. They, they even managed to prevail over certain uh, older districts which had uh, a public tradition. And so they, they managed, even in this moment of rampant communal development, to actually take over some areas and carving them out of, uh, further as their own dynastic uh, possessions right uh, but overall they they do not prevail of course over, over the main communal trend in the southern part of the paduan territory uh, so close to the boundaries with uh, ferrara we're talking essentially the ferrara in the pod delta and this in fact more uh, sort of the centralized and less urbanized areas, the development of the Este dynasty. This was actually one of the oldest dynasties ever in the Holy Roman Empire. It stemmed from uh, an eastern and independent branch of the great family of the Marquises of the uh, Obertanks. Right? These were Ligurian in origin. They were connected with the Velfen. Actually, the, the Velfen were technically a branch of the Este. Right, they had ruled in Italy and then went, like we're talking post Carolingian times, and then uh, essentially made fortune in uh, uh, in Germany back, right? And um, the Este had come thus from these northwest uh, Apenninic dimension, and they had installed themselves uh, in the in the era in, in Ferrara that basically would become later on a bit of a weaker commune again. That this is basically the Delta, there were lots of swamps around, etc. Uh, it's not quite the best place for, for a large urban development, but the city would become extremely loyal to the dynasty. And as such, in fact, later on, the Este would live on, as you know, uh, throughout, well through the modern age and uh, in uh, some pre unitary uh, st Italian states, as you know, ruling from this position. As we were saying before, there was a big deal of ecclesiastical power as well, right? Bishops had their own legal prerogatives that were, to some extent, fully preserved in spite of the communal development. They had also their military force, and they would blend in with, with the communal army, um, but they had really massive power properties, right? Uh, holdings that they would defend within the same city uh, gates. Um, when you look, for example, at the bishopric cathedral chapter monastery of St. Zeno in, in Verona, right, it's the patron of, of the city, and um, the, the bishopric of Vicenza, for example, the bishopric and cathedral chapter of Padua, the bishopric of Treviso, well, these you realize that were really powerful. The latter uh, had all a system of vassals and officials, as we were saying before, this, this area... Treviso is a bit in the northeast, uh, the limits um, of this area of substantial communal development. So you have the, the, the bishop acting a bit more like a sort of landlord with his own vassals and, um, and officials. You have the bishopric of Belluno as well, that is quite powerful, that is fairly north, like in the pre Alps. Um, yeah, but here we are distancing ourselves for, from the more urbanized areas. Um, significant. So again, you realize that consequently the bishops there were more powerful. There is no doubt that the communes, uh, so the cities, de facto were increasing their autonomy. Right? We would say communes, that there were some, say, village communes, right? Many small ones, etc. But when we talk communes in general, we're talking about the cities. Again, the, 
the centers of the sea of the diocese this roman centers well fortified and connected again having all these uh real territorial control and these were definitely increasing their autonomy even with with a bishop that technically could boast major prerogatives within the city and as far as this control in the district was concerned bishops had lots of land in the district as well and and they coexisted at a point with a communal one um overlapping or being taken over sometimes just being there right and going on their way and the um, uh, there was a lot of negotiation with the lay nobility as well bishops had their own vassals as we've seen so these would be laymen and they would act in the episcopal clientele fighting for him and etc there was however also co a conflict between the commune and, and the bishop uh, in Verona for example you realize that uh, being a very thriving uh, economic center there was a rich merchant estate that began to cooperate with the military case essentially founding them and increasing the, the power of the commune just per se this is in many ways how also the milanese expansion would happen like the the, the milanese bankers would pay the uh just the lords for for hiring troops and uh founding expeditions and they would take over the the markets of, of the cities that were conquered right so quite quite clever and sort of self um ful fulfilling and so uh, functional um we will have to talk also in the regional series about the ecclesiastical principalities of trent and aquileia these were part of that again proper massive episcopal power that controlled communes uh in, in their territories because, because they were weaker there uh, their position in trentino and Friuli, respectively makes you understand how connected to germany they really were as frontier areas and uh, essentially uh connecting with again trento is the the adige edge valley so you go down you have verona right you have uh, the brenner pass in the north um uh, the Friuli is different you access it normally from the the east right so from southeastern germany even some parts of the slavic world part of holy roman empire have to to look at them um but it, it was possible and so uh the history of these bishoprics is quite interesting on their own we, we should look at it in some depth again aquileia we already discussed it in multiple videos but trento we have still to do so uh the bishopric of trent especially was under uh, the influence of, of the german crown even though it was on the southern side of the alps it seemed at times more controlled by by the german monarchy uh, than part of the uh, part of italy as a political uh, system again that the principalities in germany had great relevance uh, the ecclesiastical principalities i mean and uh, you know that there were many electors that were uh, ecclesiastical there was some general even there because of the lack of a real public authority prevailing force we have many islands of ecclesiastical principality in germany basically more than in any in any other country at least compared to the local public authority um again you have the patriarchate of aquileia that enjoyed some very important status uh, being under both the german ruler and, and the pope and also intervening at a time even as far as western as lombardy it had a great autonomy it sent troops there did this kind of thing it's never really so important like the major power but they, they would contribute their own way the, controlling the uh the election of the patriarchate of Aquileia was of incredible importance in uh, the 12th to 13th century like the, the guy on the throne could could really do really a lot mobilizing forces intervening in the rest of northern Italy etc we'll see it better in some 
some other video. Uh, then you had, technically outside of the Holy Roman Empire, Venice, that however you couldn't quite ignore, overall being surrounded by the lagoon and being de facto impregnable, um, it had fostered its own independence. The Doge had um, a lifetime rule and uh, there was of course a, a vast mercantile dominion that uh, at this point was allied with the Byzantine Empire and however mostly opposing the aspirations of the secular Normans to block um, the Ultra Interest Rate. Uh, this obviously enough because Venice monopolized the trade between the Adriatic and the Eastern Mediterranean from there um, and Europe de facto because the Venetians controlled uh, the, the the salt mines, they controlled all the, the various um, goods that arrived to also to the mouth of the port that was um, sailed uh, sort of, you know, uh, up where it was the major way that reached Milan and from there Central Europe um, not the only one, but everything passed from from there. Uh, and Venice had the, the, the monopoly, in fact, on this. So it, this proportionate power, and the Venetians at this point are quite safe in their on their islands. They don't really care about whatever is happening. I mean, they do care a lot actually what is happening in the interline, but they didn't, they don't want to step into it because they have no no business. They are still in, very heavily involved with the Byzantine Empire and. They, they make their money in that sort of blackmail fashion of occupying the, the port citadels and being the only ones with a fleet uh, practically that can't um, can attack these from the sea and otherwise we're supplying them if they were uh, besieged from the from the uh, from the inter from 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 a terra firma and Venice does have a great relevance, as you know, with also with the wars of the Lombard League in the end that the peace is signed in, in Venice then in then in constant. So it is very involved, but it's mostly so at, at a commercial level. And yes, it does make an enormous political leverage, of course, but it's not Holy Roman Empire, it's also not a land power acting there. Um on the terra firma. Um, it control it does control. Don't get me wrong. The, the Istrian and Dalmatian coasts we were talking about the, the other day, uh, looking at the Kingdom of Croatia. But again, it that's another world, right? It belongs to a dimension that is also evenly coastal and maritime as such. So um, the Kingdom of Croatia is not part of the Holy Roman Empire, hence another world, and doesn't touch us more than much. And for this video. You have, of course, uh, the Hungarians from there trying to harass Venetian possessions in, in Dalmatia. Um, and so trying to interfere a bit with the lives of the, the Italian coastal cities on the opposite side of the Adriatic. The Venice did not have the complete control of the entire Adriatic. There were, in fact, many cities that were rival to her. I mean, not so many, but big Ancona, for example, that, that would be important for the same imperial... Uh, policy. Barbarossa besieged that, um, as for example, during his first expedition. So um, you have here the, the wall round picture. If we're not talking about Genoa or Pisa, that I made videos on respectively, and that really show you why and how they were, for example, Pisa mostly Ghibelline, fiercely Ghibelline, uh, Roman in identity and supporting. Uh, the Hohenstaufen all the way, practically interfering in the Sicilian Norman Kingdom, taking over coastal cities, uh, the ports, mostly. And so again, I chose medieval history <laughs> in my life, and so it's that messed up, it's that um, complicated, and it's difficult uh, to just being complete in the first place when you make this video, but giving an idea of the dynamics, giving an idea of here we've seen the policy of Lothar, of Saplenburg, of Conrad of Swabia, and then we looked at how essentially the, the communal power was, was organized, how the popes were seeing 
these mechanisms and the Matildic legacy is influenced in this, the, the, the secular Norman policy. And I think this interesting era of northeastern Italy too, showing the variety right, of communal and feudal power before, this is all before Frederick Barbarossa. I mean, to, if you ask a medievalist what, what is fascinating about this is, is realizing what had been existing between the Salians and Frederick. Um, and so you see, of course, Lothar uh, and Conrad having something to do with that, but mostly like a great autonomy, a great sort of, uh, nobody's on, is, is at the rudder, right? And so let's, let's basically take advantage as, mu as much as we want at least of what is happening on board before he comes back and, and requires us to do something um, for his direction. Um, so it's an incredibly complicated picture. Also, this video cannot but make it superficial to some extent. Um, but that's exactly the point. Like, let's go step by step. Let's make things in depth, in detail, as much as we can for at least a YouTube format. Uh, and let's eventually wrap it up like in some more general videos that can sort of draw some, not conclusions, but just like broader pictures so that you can go back and forth in um, proportion and uh, perspective with this stuff. I think it's it's quite it's quite relevant, quite important to, to talk the Holy Roman Empire in this depth. For today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.